Hello trumpet players, today we are going to talk about how to practice the trumpet. So obviously there's different ways to approach practicing the trumpet. What I'm going to teach you is my way and what I think is the right way. When I teach my students, this is the way that I teach them. I may not say these things specifically the way I'm going to say them now, but yes, we cover all of this stuff in the lessons. All right, but I'm going to acknowledge that there are people that teach differently and practice differently. It doesn't make them wrong and me right, or me wrong and them right. There are just different ways to practice. And in fact, I'll say this much. I got to where I am today by studying how other people practice. And I got little influences from here and there, and combined all of that into what made sense to me. All right. Uh, so let's go on. Let's, let's look at the, what I consider good practice on trumpet. We, we're going to have three things that we try to cover in our practice, three general areas of practice. The two of them can be kind of combined, but, but for the sake of being clear about what we're practicing, we're going to treat them now as two individual things. So we got three things. Um, we have first your routine. Now, some people would call this a warm up. The warm-up is included in the routine, so I don't really address it as a warm-up so much. But yes, the routine will get you warmed up. And the structure that I use for the warm-up and the routine, I just said warm-up, uh, is what I call the physical trumpet pyramid. And all that is, is a specific order for certain kinds of exercises. For example, the first thing that we do and in, in my students and my practice time is an air exercise. And this is to get the air, the mechanics of the air to, to blow uh, with the kind of support we would call it in trumpet, the kind of support that we want on the instrument. So one thing you can do is to blow backwards in the mouthpiece. And the idea is to blow so hard on, in the mouthpiece that you can kind of feel it pushing back down in your, in your belly, right? You're going to be pushing the air with your abdomen, and we want to feel it. We're going to push so hard that there's no more pushing that we can do. All right. Um, I also do this thing with the fist. We won't go into that today. Uh, the next thing we would do is a lip buzz. And if you haven't done lip buzz before, it's just simply a putting the lips together, pushing the air through, and make them vibrate against each other. Okay, and you can do melodies with that. You can, so like if you're just a beginner, you can do stuff like hot cross buns. You can do stuff like that. If you're more advanced, you can buzz more advanced stuff. The next thing is what I call the mouthpiece placement exercise. And I prefer that you hold the mouthpiece like this so that as your teacher now, you might have another teacher, but when you hold it like this, the teacher can see what you're doing. Okay. Mouthpiece placement is when you buzz. And I have a video on mouthpiece placement. So that's no over here. You can click up here and it'll take you that to that video. You're placing a buzz on a, uh, uh, placing mouthpiece on a buzzing lips. And so after that, we would do mouthpiece buzz. After that, we would do long tones. Now the long tones, Let's look at what long tones are. I'm going to have separate videos for some of these, and I will definitely have a separate video in the future about long tones. Okay? 
And so basically it's what it sounds like. Now I'm opposed to static long tones. Um, if you know about the different books that you can buy, there are um, like Schlossberg. I don't do Schlossberg anymore except for on rare occasions. Uh, but that's a, a, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying what I do is better. All right. So um, you can have a sustained tone. And what you're trying to do on that is you're trying to make sure that everything from the beginning of the note to the end of the note is the same. I know people say that's where you work on your tone. Um, I would rather you spend that time working on making the tone the same all the way through because we don't want You see how much that's changing? We don't want that. And most most beginners have a real rough time with that. Um, so, but, I, but even that, I'm not into, that's a static long tone, that doesn't move. I would rather have, so for example, I, you can practice what we call the Chickowitz exercise with, uh, with the attitude of a long tone. So you're playing long and full, but the notes are moving. And so, yes, we do want a good tone. So I'm not saying don't try to get a good tone. Of course, every time you put the instrument to your face, Get a good tone, the best tone you can always get. And yes, we want to spend time doing that on the long tone. But in terms of what we should be actively doing, we want consistency across. Consistency of tone, consistency of attack, all that. All right. So what I just did, the, the, the man who made that famous, that exercise famous, was a man named Vincent Chickowitz. And in his book about those exercises, he talks about moving long tones. It's actually not a long tone exercise, it's a flow study. But you play it with the same purpose that you play long tones. All right. So that's long tones. We will have another video later on with more detail about long tones. But definitely, that kind of stuff should be in your uh, practice time. Now, what we should talk about, and I, I'm, I'm glad I remembered this, we should also be talking about how much of each of those. And I don't believe in a lot of long tones. So let's look in percentages. I would say for um, the, the lip buzz and all that, 5% lip buzz, 5% long uh, mouthpiece buzz. The placement exercise is just like, three seconds long, so that doesn't even go in the percentage. Uh, your, your long tones might be 10 to 20% of your practice time. Don't do a lot of long tones. That can actually be worse for you than, you know that whole thing um, about too much of a good thing? Yeah, there's a lot of things you can practice and it can end up being too much of a good thing. So after long tones, I like to teach, like to, I teach my students to uh, do, we would call them scales. If you're not my student, you would say scales, but it's not just scales. So it's scales that cover your whole range. All right. And so we want to do some sort of, now, if you don't know my stuff, then maybe you might take the C major scale, for example. Let's pretend that your highest note in your range is up to G. So we would play maybe something like this. I'm just making this up, but I'm giving you an example of what you can do with your scales at this point.
what I'm doing. I'm taking the scale up, then go diatonically up one step. So like the next note in the scale, that's what diatonically means, in the scale. Um, then bring it down and then up to the next note, then down and up to the next note until you get to your highest note. Then you want to go all the way See what I'm doing? I'm going all the way down to low G and then back to where you started. And that's a great way to learn your scales. Here's the thing though, I only do one scale a day. I know a lot of people do. Now I kind of make up for it later in my practice because I do my articulation studies in every key. Uh, and so that kind of makes up for not doing every scale every day. But no, I would much rather spend my scale time focusing on one scale. Now, if you're new to trumpet, maybe you don't know how many scales there are. There are 12 major scales, actually more than that in terms of music theory, but we won't go into that now. There are 12 minor scales, 12 melodic minor scales, 12 harmonic minor scales. Then you have your... Uh, oh, and then on that side of the fence, we also have also the pentatonic scale and chromatic. So on the symmetric side, we're going to have chromatic scale, whole tone scale, diminished scale, and that's your basics. Usually, a high school student doesn't work on all of those. A great high school student might know the 12 majors, chromatic, and the 12 minors melodic minor or harmonic. Uh, so, but just giving you an idea, if you want to get ahead, then you can learn more scales. So anyway, that's next is scales. And after scale, we would do lip slurs. All right. So lip slurs, when you change notes without moving any fingers. <laughs> something like that. And you can do that on each fingering. Okay, and, and all the way down. It's the same fingerings as the chromatic scale. Open, second, first, first and second, second and third, one and three, and all three. So, uh, lip slurs have been a very important part of trumpet practice for over a hundred years. So, moving on. Actually, do you know what? <laughs> over a thousand years, if you think about it, because the original trumpets didn't have valves. The only way they could play uh, anything at all was just by doing what we call lip slurs today. So, now that I think about it, it's been since the beginning of the trumpet. All right, so after lip slurs... We want to do uh, articulation studies. Oh, actually, do you know, I skipped one. Flow, uh, pedal tones. After lip slurs, we want to do pedal tones. Pedal tones are those notes that go below the low F sharp. Now, officially, F sharp is the lowest note on the trumpet. But if we play notes that are lower than that, And I'm not playing a real lip, uh, pedal tone right now. I'm just showing you what a pedal tone is. So we can uh, play pedal tones that actually sound like notes, uh, not sirens. That was more like a siren. So let's say... Mm, you see that? So that was, actually came out as a D. Uh, so after pedal tones, then we do the articulation, uh, articulation studies. Basically, articulation is a fancy word for tongue. So you could, at this part of the routine, those kind of exercises. 
basically you're just tonguing notes over and over again. I prefer myself. I don't do those. I prefer myself uh, articulation studies that slur and tongue. And what we do is we slur more and progress towards tonguing more. So my exercises start, and remember I told you earlier, I do this in every key. Slurring four. Then the next one I'm gonna slur two. And then so on. So until we're getting to the very last one, we're gonna tongue every note. Okay. So that's articulation. Then we do intervals. So the the traditional intervals would be like stuff they like, where you keep going back to that top. No, I have something else that I do uh, because that's what fits my stuff better. Um, by the way, everything I'm talking about now, you can get in my books. And no, this was not an ad for my book. This is actually, a, a, I'm, I'm offering this sincerely and you know, because all this stuff you can come up with on your own anyway. Might be easier to use my books, but I'm not forcing you to do that. How could I anyway, right? I'm actually trying to teach you what works. So the last thing we do in this part of the routine is double tongue and triple tongue. And you know, the thing is, is we rarely have to triple tongue some people. I mean, uh, you know, I think I triple tongue more than someone who does what I do would normally triple tongue. But it is kind of rare compared to all these other things. And, and that's kind of the point of the routine you want to cover all the things, all your basics. And yes, triple tongue is a basic. I saw somewhere online the other day, someone was, was complaining that he got, uh, he had something he had to do over the weekend that had triple tongue in it. And he needed to brush up his triple tongue. And I was like blown away by that. How in the world does a, a professional trumpet player have to brush up on his triple tongue? Does, that's obviously meaning that he doesn't practice triple tongue. That should be, I do triple tongue every time I practice. Every day that I practice. Why? Because I don't want to have to brush up on anything. And how long is it going to take? Oh, we, we, we didn't cover how much all this stuff should take. Um, so we stopped with the long tones. Long tones is like 10 to 20%. And then we did scales. I think the scales can take more like 25% of your time. And this is just your time doing this routine. And then let's look at, after that we did the lip slurs. Lip slurs I think should only be 10 or less, 10%, 5%. I don't like doing a lot of lip slurs. They're good for you, but there's no need to do a whole bunch of them. And then after that, Pedal tones. Pedal tones, 3%. Don't do a lot of pedal tones. It's good just to do them. After pedal tones, we did uh, articulation studies. You can do a lot of articulation. Make it 30, 40%. And then the same thing with the multiple tongue, the, the triple tongue, double tongue. You can do as much of that as you want. Don't be afraid to do a bunch of that. Uh, all right. And that really, that's, that's the whole routine. Now, here's the thing is we also have, so that's a whole category by itself, physical stuff. Everything we've talked about except for the scales, but the way we do it, we, the way we did the scales earlier was for physical purposes. You get that fringe benefit of, of doing, you know, learning the scales also, but you have this like sp expanding scale thing, really great to do before you do your lip slurs. Then you're not just clobbering your lips with lip slurs. Okay, so but now we want to also talk about technique. That's the second kind of practice. So, in the context of technique, we're going to be doing scales again. So, remember, I gave you the, the list of scales, the different kinds of scales you can have. But we're going to also now, in, in the context of technique, we want to do arpeggios. And how many arpeggios are there? There's like so many, I'm not gonna go into it now. 
And once again, just like with the scales, I only like to practice one a day. Uh, if you practice your arpeggios correctly, you don't have to do more than one a day. And then the last version of the last uh, exercise category and the technique, I like to do what I call chromatic patterns. And that's just like bizarre stuff. That's just hard. And that's really where you get your technique from. I don't believe there's people that that do from technique books like really like really really hard bizarre stuff but that shouldn't be the gist of your technique effort so that's why i had it last here that shouldn't be what you do if you let's put it this way if you can't play all your scales through all the different patterns you're not ready for that other stuff put a priority on it that other stuff is fun, it's interesting, more interesting than just doing the same scale stuff over and over again. But no, don't, don't sacrifice that stuff you need more. So your scale stuff, you're gonna need all the time. Same thing with the arpeggio stuff. Scales and arpeggios are the building blocks of music. If you've mastered your scales and you've mastered your arpeggios, You've got all the building blocks you need to create music. So now that leads us to the third type of practice. And this one is contrast with these other two. Everything else we've talked to, everything else we've talked about so far today should only be half of your practice time or less. The rest of it should be practicing this third category. Third category, and that's playing literature, practicing literature. And what is literature? That's just a fancy word for saying songs. Practice songs, practice music. Your music time should be more than half of your practice time. Now remember I told you that it doesn't have to be every day. So like say hypothetically you did your, the other 50% with all the exercises in it one day. I think it's okay to do only a real quick warm up the next day and spend the whole day practicing music. So we want to have a, a split there, 50%. If your routine is so long that you can't do a, a routine and practice music in one day, you have to split it up like this. Uh, I have a video called the 50% rule. And you can click here. There's going to be a bunch of those. Click here and go to the 50% rule video. Okay, now, there are specific ways to practice music. And if all you do is try to get it right, you're not practicing right. There's a whole sequence of practicing songs that I teach. It has seven stages. You don't have to do all seven, but doing most of them is a good idea. Uh, we want to study the music. How do you study the music? Well, you can study it with your eyes and look, but the best way to study with your ears. Listen to the music so that you know how it goes. And then the next thing you do is use a proven practice technique to learn the music. I won't go into that because that's going to be another separate video. What we're talking about is the basics of what you need to practice. That's what this video is about. We're going through the whole list. If you practiced all the stuff that we talked about today, the routine, which is gonna have lip buzz, mouthpiece buzz, long tones, scales, and lip slurs, and pedal tones, and articulation studies, and multiple tongue, then we're gonna have scales, and arpeggios, and other patterns. If you practice all that and spend most of your time practicing music, I promise you, you'll do a good job. As long as you hold yourself to a high standard, I promise you, you'll do a great job on the trumpet. Okay, there, are, there can be some exceptions, but these are the main, so let's put it this way. This, as opposed to someone who's practicing but doesn't know what to practice, this is better. Much, much, much better. All right. So that's practicing the trumpet. That's 
what you want to do. That's what you want to spend your time doing. Uh, there's, I've seen it break down on two different sides. I've seen people only ever practice music. Not a good idea. If you don't practice any exercises at all, you're going to be deficient in something. That's sort of like having a diet that doesn't have certain vitamins or minerals in it. And if you keep that diet for too long, you're going to get sick. Same thing with this kind of practice. If all you ever practice is stuff, music stuff that you like, you like this song for band or whatever, right? If that's all you do, you will not get as good as you are, have the potential to do. You will never play as well as it's possible for you to play. But the same is also true for people who never practice music. And this is actually more common, I think, in my opinion, amongst trumpet players. There is a tendency for people to only practice exercises. In fact, it's taught that way. And I think that's just bizarre. How can you become a great player if all you practice is exercise? How can you play musically? Which is the point, right? How can you practice, uh, practice play musically in performance if uh, only a tiny fraction of the time you spend practicing is ever dedicated to music? You know, just off the top of my head, I remember someone, because I have books with all this tech exercises and all that stuff in there. I've got plenty of books about that. But I had got someone uh, emailed me one time and said, Eddie, um, how come your books don't have dynamics in them and stuff like that, different articulations? And I asked the guy, I said, are you practicing music at all? He says, no. I said, that's why you don't understand. Those exercises aren't supposed to cover every possibility. That's what the music does. If you spend enough time practicing music, you'll cover all of those bases that you need. The routine only hits the basics, the basic basics, not the musical basics, but like physically what you have to do. But most of your time should be spent practicing music. And music is never done like exercises. So you're going to have notes that start soft and get loud. And you're going to have notes that, that, um, that uh, have vibrato on them and phrasing and all that nice, beautiful stuff. That should not be in your routine. If you're going to practice more than half of your time on music, you're getting plenty of that. You don't need it in your routine. All right? So that's my take on what you need to practice. That's my take. I believe that you should separate your musical practice from the technical practice and the physical practice. Do more than 50% of that on the music stuff. And then cover all of those bases that I told you. All those different kinds of exercises. And you know what? Here's the thing that I think people, they get discouraged because that's a lot of exercises, right? But don't do a lot of it. Especially if you're a beginner. Do one or two notes for your long tones. If you're a beginner, just play one or two long notes. Or you could get my book. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I do have a book that's called Chops Express. And if you only have 30 minutes to practice, the Chops Express book has built within it a routine that will cover all these bases for you. And you'll still have 15 minutes to practice afterwards on music. It's a, you know, it's one of the best books I ever wrote because it fills, it fulfills a, a purpose in people's lives. It's a short routine, but it has everything in it that you need. Alternatively, you can just make up your own short routine based on what you learned in this video. So I'm really not trying to sell a book here. Um, but yeah, with what you know now, you know what you need to practice. Well, you know, you know what you need to spend your time on. All right. Well, very good. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned a lot from it. If you want more videos like this, you can subscribe and check out. Uh, we're almost up to 300 videos already, and there's a lot more to come. And so other than that, God bless you, and we'll see you on the next video.
thank you very much.